Good day, everybody. It's Carpo. Welcome to my reality. My subject matter for today is uh, varied. My topic's varied, but uh, this particular video uh, I'm dedicating to ele the electron. I, uh, I've been very interested lately in the, uh, the elements and how the elements exchange electrons in order to create reactions within chemicals. Uh, you know, chlorine gas, various things like that, that uh, that's a bad example, but you know, the way that certain chemicals, especially uh, volatile chemicals, who have a, they have a loose electron, this is what's claimed, that it's missing an electron and that when another one comes near it, the, the exchange of electrons creates the reaction. Now, before I go any deeper, I want to say, first off, uh, disclaimer, I'm not a scientist and I do not know what I'm talking about here. I know that. And this is why I'm doing this video is because I picked a subject that I was interested in, which was atoms. And I wanted to know more about it. And so I took an approach of, by asking a question, do electrons really exist? And then I googled it. And I dug through all the information I could. And I found that this is an argument that's not even worth having with people. Um, the scientists will t give you all this technical jargon as to why electrons do exist. And the layman will ask questions like, well, have we ever seen an electron? And the answer is no, we've never seen an electron. Uh, but we can measure them through particular means by using... Um, there was one experiment, I believe, that was done, you know, whatever, 100, 150 years ago by a guy who... He suspended uh, droplets of oil in... Um, and affected the gravity by... Uh, determined the electrons by, by checking the gravity or how much force it took to... Stuff that I don't understand, right? This is my whole point. And <clears throat> it shows that, yes, uh, there probably are electrons, okay? I'm not disputing the fact that electrons exist. What I'm saying is that we have no idea what really goes on, what an electron is, or how it functions. Just like we don't understand what an atom is. We don't know what's in an atom. We do the best we can with the experiments. But, so let me, let me, let me leave it this and say, um, before I go too far, that observer effect is where I'm going with this, you know, and I know that uh, there's a lot of dispute about observer effect, but um, basically the wave-particle duality that uh, the outcome of an observation is either predetermined or determined according to how the observer wants to see it. So it leads to this question about what about all these scientific experiments that have been, you know, carried out on the atomic level over the last hundred years that uh, claim to have these answers, but it makes me one wonder, what did they expect to find when they were doing the experiments? What were they expecting to see when looking at things on the atomic level? And for those who aren't aware of the double slit experiment, I really can't express how, where I'm going with this, but for those who know what I'm talking about, it really leaves one to, to re realize what they mean by illusion. You know, um, an electron has no real mass, okay? An electron is a force of energy, is the way I see it, and that's the way it's described. Um, and they claim that the nucleus, the protons, have what? Do they have mass? I don't know, but inside those proto protons and electrons, they say they're quarks. What are these quarks? We don't know. <laughs> so, I'm not disputing the validity of scientific endeavors. We have come so far in understanding the physics of the world around us. But physics has, in my eyes, uh, come to a dead end on atomic understanding until uh, we can either develop devices to see electrons and understand what they're doing, which I don't think is a, uh, possible just because of the fact that um, we have to measure effects of electrons rather than electrons themselves. The speed at which they're spinning, which people picture these electrons spinning around a proton, I don't see it like that. I see it as a, a, a crystalline structure that's missing a piece, you know, and these, this is just my visual representation of what it is. But everything is in crystalline structure and format in this universe, so there's no reason to think that atoms wouldn't follow that exact same pattern. Uh, we talk about fractals a lot in this world, and, and uh, you can look at the universe and see it in a tree, um, down into the cell, and down into the... Uh, molecular level all the way down into your, uh, you know, to the atomic level. And you would think that there's something going on within an atom 
that has mass. And this is what is one of the hardest things when people talk about the universe being an illusion. People just say, what are you talking about? I can feel the ground, I know what's here. It's, it's, it's about everything being a force. Little tiny atoms pushing against one another with electrical force. So, what creates materials? Dirt, you know, soil, metals. 70% you know, of the atoms on the periodic table are metals, 70%. They're not the most abundant, but they're most abundant on the periodic table of elements. People just say, uh, you know, that we've, we understand the periodic table pretty well. Uh, the man who created it left a bunch of blank spots for us to fill in and we confirmed his research. Um, but over the last 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, we've created new elements. And some of these last a short time, some of them last only a fraction of a second. But we've created them. So this leads me to wonder what elements exist that we have not seen yet. And some scientists will tell you there aren't any, you know, and some will say there's probably plenty. Things that we can't comprehend. Um, I don't know. That, that's irrelevant to me, I guess. What I'm saying is that what we think to be fixed and certain is always flawed. Because every time a new discovery is made, it takes a while for it to get through the minds of the scientists to where they really can't dispute it anymore, and they finally have to accept it. Um, Newton's law, Einstein's law, all these things are consistently changing through other research, but we have a hard time breaking away from certain laws. You know, Einstein went crazy the second half of his life trying to reconcile some of his own discoveries. It's from what I've heard. I mean, this is just uh, that he was he, he found God halfway through his life, but he couldn't explain it through his works. And it was a very difficult thing for him to deal with. And this has happened to a lot of scientists. A lot of people have uh, locked themselves away for the latter part of their lives because they can't reconcile with the discoveries they've made and what they think that they should be finding. And it's funny to me because I, I see everything as being very simple. Like somebody once said, uh, a lot of people have said, you know, we overcomplicate overcompl things, especially science. You know, we, we, we need complicated instruments to measure things. But instead of thinking on such an, un, you know, the way that we some of our theories are theories that don't fit the structure of life and they don't fit the natural pattern of things or natural law. So we use mathematics because it explains a lot to us, but still we're just reading a problem. We're not seeing what it really means. And around and around we go. So being a layman of average intelligence and average schooling that's why I looked into the electron to ask myself, does it exist? Because I wanted to see if a person really wanted to understand, if, if the average person who was not a physicist or scientist of any way wanted to understand whether they did exist or not, he would have a hell of a time finding the answers. Because there are too many different sides to understand. And since we don't know the technical jargon, it makes it really difficult for us to say yes or no, and we tend to just agree with science when they say something. So, in conclusion, no, I'm not denying that there's an electrical force within the atom that somehow exchanges some sort of what we call an electron. But as to what that electron is remains to be seen. And as to whether the nucleus of an atom has really any mass whatsoever remains to be seen. My thought is that frequencies give rise to form. And it's a very simple way of looking at things. This is what I believe the Word of God to be. This is what I believe the, uh, uh, in the beginning, I, I believe that matter is created through the breath of the universe. There's these pulses and waves and that elements can be created and destroyed by cosmic waves. And right now we can see how radiation degrades and. We can measure the age of, you know, the Earth by using, uh, actually, the, here, this is another thing I'd like to throw in here. You ask somebody how old the Earth is, okay? And they're going to tell you, whatever, what, 4.6 billion years old, I think? And uh, I'm going to say, honestly, 
It's, uh, we don't know. Uh, this is from what I've gathered. The 4.6 billion year Earth came from the study done on, on an asteroid, I think back in the 50s, where a chunk of asteroid was that landed, you know, a chunk from space, which we just assume is the same age as, the, as our solar system, landed on the Earth. We measured this rock and it took this guy a really long time to get the measurements he needed. He had to, this was the first clean room was invented for this process because what happens is uranium, the naturally occurring uranium in rock, turns to, it degrades into lead. So uranium atoms convert into lead atoms at a particular rate. This is how we get the second as well, the atomic clock. Atoms degrade at a particular rate. So, or yeah, whatever, whatever happens there, okay, you know what I'm saying. Um, so he measured these rocks, finally got consistent samples, and found out that this rock was 4.6 billion years old. So instantly the assumption was that the Earth was 4.6 billion years old. So this could go in one of two directions, you know, the creationists could use this to say, see, the Earth really could be 6,000 years old, which is ludicrous to me, but it could be used that way. Or the information could be shown to say, hey, look, the Earth could be five, six billion years old. And the fact is, once again, we like to look at the stars in the universe and think that we know what they're made of, think that we know how they work, think that we know how everything functions. But we're just clueless. And we're getting better at it. But until we let our arrogance, I mean, as long as we let our arrogance get the better of us, we're going to continue to push scientific theories such as dark matter and the Big Bang onto people and they're going to eat it up. And then they're going to tell their friends at work, hey, it's dark matter. Oh, it's the Big Bang. And people believe this. And I've talked to so many people who talk about the Big Bang Theory and I'm like, do you understand how it works or what it is? No, of course not. That's what science told us happened. So maybe it's not about this matter. And this is what they're trying to understand, and in conclusion here, this, is that they're trying to understand how the universe came to be, and how all this matter came to be, and that it must have started with matter. But if you consider that atoms may be nothing but empty space, completely, just charges, just an electrical pulse of energy, a universe within itself, it changes the whole paradigm. It allows you to see that it all could have sprung up from nothing. It just needed that vibrational force to whatever that may be, you know, whether it's a cosmic frequency, whether it's a wave of energy, you know, I don't know, you know. The spectrum that we see, the narrow band of colors that we see is in this vast sea of different frequencies and waves and light and microwaves and radiation. It's insane, you know. And we're seeing on the same spectrum is everything else, okay? We see on the same spectrum as radio waves. It's just we are seeing a very faster vibrating version of that. And uh, so our eyes are literally creating mass by the action of seeing. If you couldn't see colors and all you could see, let's say for example was, let's say you had x-ray vision, your, ex, your, your, your vision would penetrate through the soil. You would see the rocks below the soil. Do you get what I'm saying here? If you, if you had x-ray vision, you would see through most things and just pick up metal pieces. Your world would be so completely different. Just like if you saw an infrared at nighttime, you'd be able to see all the warm spots. You'd, you'd have a completely different outlook on the world. And uh, I uploaded a Manly Hall video earlier when he was talking about this. I, only, I can only upload 15 minutes at a time, but it was an amazing one about uh, an amazing lecture about the senses and the sense of sight and how many people have spent their lives thinking that they know something or see something but really don't because they don't know that they're seeing colors uh, differently than other people I gotta go now because I'm running out of time which is probably a good thing because I could go on about this forever so peace out everybody talk to you soon